What's that? Are you recording the online lectures already? Right now. Just, I just clicked the record button. So I, my plan is to uh, just, well, I don't know, I shouldn't say too much about my plan because uh, it could change, but we don't uh, pick up with school until the 30th now because the break has been extended by a week. So yes, this course, as with probably every other course, will be going online, but don't even worry about that until the 30th. A two-week spring break, I, I'm not giving you homework to do over that time period, so you can relax and enjoy yourself uh, before you all die of coronavirus. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Kidding. Okay. Probably not fine enough. Um, all right. Who needs discussion sheet one for Kierkegaard? Well, we're just about done with it, but do you need it? I don't need the sheet. I just need the sheet. Oh, okay. So, your first year, I kind of want to say that. So, since we added the sheet, are they adding the sheet to the school? I have no idea. No, I hope it's just. They said they can't do that. No, so they just based it out on the Yes, we just lose it. So, we can do that. We just lose the week next month. So actually, you know what, let me hand out discussion sheet two now, so we're about to transition to this. It depends. How far it is. I, I just, my sociology professor was saying today that she has one of her students are quarantined with symptoms. Really? Yes. And, and we end of class after she just shares pizza with everybody. <laughs> yeah. And my father does. My friend works okay. out This is why I don't touch people. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 Plenty of wipes here. This is Corona free right here. It says Corona free. No, thank you. Yeah, no, no. Everybody goes. It's all crazy. It's crazy. This is just the most insane thing. It's how much time we've been having. Like, March Madness time we've been having. Like, that's... That is just unheard of, I suppose. You know, this is a time, this is an opportunity for us to pause and philosophize. That's what people hopefully are doing with all their quarantine time. Sitting there philosophizing, right? Yeah, right. They do the Netflix. 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 <laughs> so that is my that is my admonition to you as we as we are about to have a major change of life. Uh, take advantage of this time of of things kind of dying down a bit to do something really good. Because some of the best things you can do, you can do right in your own room. You can learn, you can write, you can ponder, reflect, pray. Um, Remember the Pascal quote? How fitting is that for today? I mean, for now. The most famous one, apparently, I don't know what his famous one is, but the video we watched seemed to think that his most famous quote from the Ponce was, all, I don't know if I can remember it perfectly, but all the evils in the world has something. I know. It was something more like, bigger, you know, something. I, I know it's like something smaller, so I forget. It was something like all of the worst problems in the world basically flow from, flow from people's inability to sit quietly in their rooms and think. So, because we, for some reason, just can't do that. We get ourselves into all sorts of other ridiculous messes that shouldn't have happened in the first place. No, we should leave our rooms uh, as well when we can. But we should also stay in our rooms sometimes to think philosophize, to reason, to read, to write. You could even uh, physically write some things down in a journal or something. Wow, that would be, that would be awesome. Uh, so so cigar, uh, cigar smoking Kierkegaard. He's sitting there in Copenhagen one Sunday afternoon. And he comes to a recognition while smoking this cigar. Did I have you read this, or did the reading that you did for the quiz end right before this? Does this sound familiar from the reading at all? No. no. Oh, okay. So this sounds really great to you guys. All right, well, let me just back up for a second here. So we've talked about all the stuff, stuff up to the last question there on the first discussion sheet. The last part of the section you read, then, was our author pointing out that the real stunning thing here is that despite the incredible darkness of Kierkegaard, despite the incredible depths to which he sunk, and he did, and he was so completely open, uh, he didn't hide anything in his writing. D despite how deep he sunk, he never despaired, and he never doubted. He always remained true to himself, just like Job. Kierkegaard succeeded in Nietzsche's own words, in becoming the individual he was. He became who he was, which of course, superficially, sounds like a truism which is a, like a meaningless statement. A is A. It doesn't say anything. But if you look at it more deeply, it's not a truism at all. It's the most important thing we can do is become who we are. 
uh, at the deepest level instead of living the superficial, hypocritical type of life. All right, so now moving on to our present consideration. When he sat one Sunday afternoon in Fredericksburg Garden in Copenhagen smoking a cigar, as was his habit, and turning over a great many things in his mind, he suddenly reflected that he had as yet made no career for himself. Whereas everywhere around him, he saw men of his age becoming celebrated, establishing themselves as renowned benefactors of mankind. That's kind of humorous. So he's sitting there smoking a cigar one afternoon and realizes, I don't have a career. <laughs> so, I don't know how old he was when that happened, but... Uh, 27? Maybe. Is it really? Oh, do, do you remember that? Or? Yeah, it was 26. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, okay. He was living off his dad's money. Uh-huh. Uh, whoops, I have no career. I forgot about that. Um, he's, so he's reflecting on all of his peers and the people of his age who, have, who are being celebrated as benefactors, meaning benefiters, those who benefit society in general. They were benefactors because all their efforts were directed at making life Unfortunately, no. The opposite? Well, not the opposite, but they were missing the question. They were consider all of these supposedly great minds of his age, great men and women of his age, were dedic were being heralded as benefactors of mankind because they were all making life easier. Easier. Whether materially by constructing railroads, steamboats, telegraph lines, or intellectually by publishing easy compendiums of universal knowledge, or, most audacious of all, spiritually, by showing how thought itself could make spiritual existence systematically easier and easier. Kier as Kierkegaard's cigar burned down, he lighted on another train of reflection that held him. It occurred to him that since everyone was engaged everywhere in making things easy, perhaps someone might be needed to make things hard, hard again. Wait, hold on, but... Making things better, well, making things easier, do make things better. Sometimes, and sometimes they make them worse. Making it better, but not making it stronger naturally. You, you get what I'm saying. the best. Let me well, let me ask. Well, let's, well, let's pause there and let's consider that. Does making life easier necessarily make it better? You have access to any piece of knowledge on the planet at your fingertips. Does that, does that guarantee that like, we can be better? Well, that depends on the person. It depends on the person. depends how we define better. Because, I mean, a lot of people, like, the more they know, it's not the better off they are. The more they know, the, the harder the more, yeah. it is to face all of the facts. The more confused, the the more more confused they get. Like, ignorance yeah. is bliss. Ignorance is bliss, on the other hand. OK. Did you have a thought? I'm just saying, in the old days, like, it's easier. Internet's easier. Lots yeah. terrible stuff on there. Yeah. So it's easy. You know, we shouldn't arbitrarily oppose things becoming easier. We all benefit from things being easier today in regards, and it would be stupid to just categorically oppose that. The problem, I think, is simply equating easier with better. I mean, reflect on the most meaningful, significant periods in your life where you're most proud of. This is, of course, entirely subjective, so I don't know what's going to come to me asking this, but just what the times in your life that you are most proud of and that you look most fondly upon that you're really uh, glad you did. Were those usually easy things or hard things? Hard things. Yeah. 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 Hard. Hard. They're usually hard, aren't they? Uh, you know, I, I mean, sure, it's nice to just kind of sit back and relax, but there's nothing wrong with that either. But I think that we mo I think that the vast majority of people, if they're really honest with themselves, looking back on what they've done, they're most proud of those times that they've accomplished things that were difficult and hard. And it's a paradox, because we should want to make life easier. You know, the, who, who's really out there to make life harder in the, in the worst sense of the word? People who tell the truth. Well, in that, the, that would be in, the, in a good sense of the word, I'd say, because truth tends to hurt. But that's a good way of making life harder. Liars? Liars, certainly. How about terrorists? They're really out to make life harder. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, Kierkegaard's not telling us to become terrorists here. That also makes life harder. But it doesn't make it better. Either. So the point here is not to say easier equals better or worse. The point is not to say harder equals better or worse. The point is to say that they're different questions. They don't necessarily converge. Um, the, the key here is to make life better. And sometimes, at least, that means making it harder. Sometimes that means making it harder. Kierkegaard 
sees no one taking up that part of the task, so he takes it upon himself. The minority. Yeah, and that's exactly, and this, that's why I have the first question, the second sheet. It's exactly what, Kier what uh, Socrates thought his job was thousands of years earlier. But first, let me give you something for that last question, the first sheet. So, just to, let me just compact what I said into a, a brief sentence here. Everyone hailed as a benefactor. Society was making life easy. Maybe someone was needed. You know, this dichotomy plays out a lot in, in just ordinary events in society today. You see so many things. Every, every passing day, almost, we see something made significantly easier. More parking lots closer to things we want to go to. More escalators so we don't have to walk up stairs. More machines to do for us quick, uh, without effort, what we used to be able to do just as quickly, but with some actual elbow grease. Uh, and yet, at the same time, as all of these innovations come out and these changes come out, we also see more and more people finding this, finding their lives too easy, to, uh, on the physical level at least. And then specifically signing up for things like what? Working out? Yeah, like these brutal work workout regimens that are just miserable, like, and, and, and they pay money to have coaches screaming at them, and like, and, and then people are signing up for weirder and weirder things. Like, and I must admit, I, I've been attracted to do these things. I did a, I did a Tough Mudder some years. Does that still exist, Tough yeah, Mudder? I don't know, like the Spartan races? Like one of those? Yeah, I think it was something like that. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. it was before those, I think. I did a Tough Mudder maybe a decade well, or something. you run a mile in mud or something, right? Oh, you do a lot. Oh, you, have yeah, to, like, you have to run through yeah. fire and jump in a nice cold the plate. Climb and too, like, and climb up and down a mountain, carrying a log and stuff like it's that. Really, if you like, train beforehand, it's probably like really fun. It was, yeah, I didn't train enough. For a guy. My leg locked up, my whole leg oh, gets uh, what do you call that, when your muscle just turns to like a rock. Cramp. I got all, so I had to like limp for the last three miles of it. It was, but it was good, I'm, glad, I'm actually glad, I wouldn't do it again, I'm glad I did it. Um, so, but we keep seeing more and more of these things come up in society. Because those things are trying to fill a gap that we've created in our lives by making everything so easy. Here the guys right. We need someone to make it hard. Not universally harder, that's what the terrorists do. They want <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in some cases harder. So that it can be better. Um, let's, uh, let's take a look at our... Really, it's like you're making people harder themselves. Yeah. Because no, yeah, no one else can do that for you. Yeah. Because they'll get sued if they do. So. Oh, no, no. <laughs> so do you hear the He was trying to make blood harder. He was trying to get him with a biological therapy. Wow. Wow. He shot? No, he didn't get shot. Okay. Well, that, so was, uh, okay. that, that would be a bad way of going around making life, life harder, certainly. I, thankfully, Kierkegaard had no terrorist inclinations. But uh, he's asking us to examine our own lives, I think, and see where we are becoming uh, moral or intellectual or even spiritual cream puffs and just living a, a delicate life that's just catering to our own little eccentricities and, and the little the little finickiness that, that we have and just you know that, that easy living is not necessarily good living. Why? Well we're always trying to make people feel better, aren't we? And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we have to step back and consider that what's greater than feel. How you feel versus how you actually are. R is greater than fear. So I need to write that down. Stop looking only at that. Stop looking at that. <laughs> and R, of course, is greater. Is greater. There's my is greater sign. The alligator eats the greater one, as we learned in elementary oh my school. God. Just uh, <laughs> this, of course, is flows from our. What's the name of this course again? Existential. Our existence. Yeah. So this is oh. this is precisely the existential theme here. Focus on the existence itself. The feelings are more superficial. They come and they go. They don't define the real worth of things. 
So what's your application feelings? What's the the application of them? Yeah. What are they what are they for? Kind of what, why are they here? Why the, why do we why have feelings? Like, why are we pretending that they're doing I, mean, I, I don't know the facts here. I'm just asking. Why do we have feelings? It's a great question. Feelings Hormones that are really <laughs> <is>. <laughs> I mean, what feelings is that give us the strength to feelings if they're subordinate to reason, which they must which we must try to always make sure they are. We can't choose our feelings. But when you feel something arising within you, whatever inclination it happens to be, your duty then is to pause and reflect and ask yourself, is this what or what? Yeah, is this inclining me towards something good or something bad? It's very simple. You always ask yourself that question. If it's inclining you towards something good, then you feed it. You know, there's this, there's this Native American parable that uh, about this was an image for the human soul. And there, there's like a bad wolf and a good wolf always fighting out, duking it out within the soul. Um, and then this boy asked his father, well, which wolf is going to win? And he said, whichever one you feed. Whichever one you feed. Because they're both in there. So which one do you feed? So we have these feelings rise up within us. And they can help us to choose the good, or they can lead us away from the good. But we have to actually consider. You know, they're, they're, they're arbitrary in and of themselves. The feelings by themselves don't, aren't good or bad. They're just kind of indifferent. We certainly, the tools. Yeah, certainly you could be too bad, but what about being too good? Is that also a bad thing? It, it can be too bad to be also a good thing? Nietzsche would say so. Like hard on people maybe like in a, in a way too bad? To be Nietzsche um, sees good and evil though as opposites of relation, not opposites of privation, which I would say is his error. But if I get into that right now, I might get into a real big tangent. Um, let, me, let, me, let me hold on right. a bit. Um, so, but Socrates here, what does this have to do with Socrates? Well, who remembers what Socrates, what image Socrates used for himself? My intro Phil or anybody. Do you mean like the bug? The bug, the, oh, the, uh, the, the biting fly. Yeah, fly. The gas fly, the horse fly, the, a biting, stinging fly. That's Socrates' spirit animal. You know, <laughs> most people if they ask me yes, someone what a spirit animal is, they're gonna say like an eagle or a lion or something. For Socrates, it's a fly. So if he's a fly, I'm a moth. You're a moth. You're moth. What man. are you? I haven't thought about it. I'm an evil moth. I, I, I mean, I'm fine being a fly also. <laughs> why, why, is he, why is Why is Socrates a fly? Why is he a fly? Well, a fl every philosophical example has to do with horses for some reason in ancient Greece. Um, apparently, I don't know anything about horses, but apparently some of them are really lazy. And in Athens, at least, there were a number of lazy horses who derived great benefit, ironically from having a really annoying fly come and sting them and bite them and, and, and annoy them because they wouldn't move otherwise. It's like the only way they could actually get moved is if some annoying fly started harassing them. Socrates sees himself as that fly for morally decadent Athens. Kierkegaard, I think, uh, Kierkegaard is certainly, and not just I think, he is explicitly ex inspired by that. You know what moths do? They fly yeah. into flames and die. And die. Well, I'm going to see how they live. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a gadfly. Uh, uh -huh. They eat the dust off your clothes. Really? Yeah. They uh, they like to eat wool clothing also. Yeah, they? I but think that's it too. I'm not actually I'm not They eat dust off of you. So they're beneficial. In a way. Not really. I love it when we get moths in our house. It's weird, but my kids just love chasing them around. And they're like, they're not... They don't sting or anything. So. I just want you see. <laughs> just little pantry ones. Okay, okay. not the huge ones. Okay, when they take yeah. the light, they're like attracted to the light. Yeah, the they get the light. They're unpredictable. I know. They I just pull those things on the I don't remember those. Yeah, yeah, and they have a bug zapping light. They're so big. They like ruin all. I'm like their version of Hitler. Put it somewhere else. I don't know. Put it somewhere else. That's how my brother is with spiders. I can't stand spiders. <laughs> I am the spider like swatter. Like no, I'm the one. Do you keep sending me more ants? We're basically ants. I have no idea. I suppose it's going to be somewhat difficult for us to stay on topic with such exciting in the air. But all right, well, let's try them. All right, so what should we have down for Socrates? Socrates is someone who sees the good and the bad. Yeah, but you can't just say that. 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 You can't just say
for Athens. And that basically ties into what Kierkegaard was saying on the last sheet. It's a bit repetitive, but um, I suppose, well, I'll suppose I'll just leave it at that. The ancient Socrates played the gadfly for his fellow thieves, stinging them into awareness of their own ignorance. So Kierkegaard would find his task, he told himself, in raising difficulties for the easy conscience of an age that was smug in the conviction of its own material progress and intellectual enlightenment. So he sees an easy conscience. Kierkegaard says modern society, he's speaking in the 1800s, but again, it's the same age we live in now, intellectually, certainly. Uh, uh, I'm going to put that the second sheet with you. Second sheet, let me get that for you. Thank you. Anyways. So what's an easy conscience then? A flexible one? Flex yeah, too flexible to, to uh, yeah, if you have an easy conscience, you're very willing to tell yourself what? You're, you're very eager to find what for anything you do? Just all sorts of justifications and rationalizations. Kierkegaard, say mod this modern society, especially with all this rationalist philosophy, is able to just make itself feel like it's fine, no matter what. It's able to justify it. It's, it thinks it can justify anything. It thinks it can, it can intellectually shrug off any difficulty. So he's there to come up with difficulties, hopefully they can't shrug off. In his estimate of Socrates, as on most other points, Kierkegaard is the diametric opposite of Nietzsche. But, uh, this is from the book. The two, full, the two agree only in the importance they attach to the gadfly of Athens, that is Socrates. Kierkegaard was interested not in the Socrates who was the mouthpiece for Platonism. Uh, quick note for those who aren't aware, as I was telling my intro film classes, Socrates and Plato, yes, they're two different people. Plato was a student of Socrates, but Socrates wrote nothing, and Plato only wrote what Socrates said, ostensibly. So basically, when you refer to Plato or Socrates, you usually refer to the same corpus of work. Uh, this is a little off topic, but who was the teacher of Alexander the Great? Aristotle? Aristotle, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, 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 awesome. really, that's pretty amazing. Um, good philosophy's power. Mm -hmm. Aristotle was probably even better philosopher than, than Socrates and Plato, even though Socrates was the, the better man. He was the best. More realistic. Yeah, he, yeah, exactly. Um, so Plato, everyone agrees, uh, does, a num does quite a bit of his own philosophizing and just kind of puts it in the mouth of Socrates and dialogues he wrote, even though it's quite good that Socrates didn't literally say all those things. So it's always a matter of debate what exactly Socrates said and what exactly Plato was just using as a mouthpiece for. The point here is that uh, Kierkegaard doesn't really care about all that Platonism stuff. He cares about Socrates the man. But he sees in the life of Socrates an inspiration and an example. Now, as it says here, um, Nietzsche is the diametric opposite. So they're both existentialists, they're diametric opposite of each other. Uh, Kierkegaard saw Socrates as a kind of, as, a, as an inspiration, as an example for what philosophy needs to become, needs to return to, for uh, what it should do, which is staying our conscience to, uh, to be more moral. Nietzsche sees Socrates as the one who destroyed philosophy uh, by making it care about truth and morality and, and, and you know, acting with justice. I think this is a really important question. Is philosophy artificial, or should it be a natural thing that we that we just obviously just do. I think it should be natural. I hate it when I see philosophy decked out in all of these new words that philosophers well, feel like they need to invent. In a way, it's sort of like the like a concept. It's like you don't talk about racism, and some people just don't talk about like it's like the concept that was made by men, so people like uh -huh. sort of demean it. In a way, it's like a natural uh -huh. process of life. So if somebody can't really, they don't need to be philosophical to live and do anything they want. Blah blah. blah. Yeah, it didn't formally exist until 2,500 years ago. It's all about survival. Like, when did it actually start is the real question. Yeah, so it's always, you know, that's the, it didn't exist as a defined thing until... Why did it need Plato. to come to be? Like, why did man need to create philosophy? I mean, guess that's right. Did, did you just get bored? Nothing else better to do? Like, well, man, I mean, <laughs> broadly speaking, I would wager man has always been philosophical. Uh, right. But it didn't become an actual 
an actual regimented pursuit until Plato slash Socrates. Right. Um, and it, it became more, uh, and that has dangers with it as well. The system is systematic, wait, systemization or systematize, whatever. Uh, that has these dangers, which I just brought up of, you know, just decking it. Philosophy is supposed to be so natural because it addresses the questions that everyone naturally has. Uh, when we deck it out with so many conjured up words and systems that you can't even have a philosophical conversation with someone who hasn't spent years learning all these terms, that we kind of defeat the purpose of it, I would say. And existentialism says the same thing. It's, it, it's, it's, uh, it rebels against this ultra analytical trend in philosophy in the modern era, where if you try to pick up a, a work of analytic philosophy, it'll look like a different language, literally, because they, they, they use so many symbols that they, they, they can't even use sentences. It's, it's weird. I still struggle getting, making my way through a lot of these things I have to read, working on my PhD. Um, but anyway, uh, it should, whenever possible, be phrased in such a way that it's natural, I think. Wait, what, what symbols do they use? Well, I mean, uh, well, Greek symbols are the go-to symbols, but they won't, they won't, what I mean is they try to turn it into like math. So math is done mostly in symbols, right? Yeah. When you do an equation, you don't describe it, because that would be ridiculous. It's math. You don't need to describe an equation. You can just toss it on the board in, in numbers and symbols. What analytic philosophy does is it tries to take philosophical ponderings and put it entirely into that systematic, symbolic approach. And it empties it of the, it doesn't, I shouldn't say it completely empties it. It's still important, but it, it, it's, it's unnatural. It's, I don't think it's how philosophy should be. So is it basically like if you look at something in the dictionary and you don't know what the definition is, you then have to look up the corresponding definitions to figure out the original definition? Yeah, it wraps you up in a spiral of looking one thing up and then another thing up. Yeah, and then which is why ordinary people can't even engage in that conversation in the first place because it's just too much time to learn all the lingo. Um, and look, we do math and symbols. That's great. On a day of work. You don't make the important decisions of your life with tables of P and Q and not and if and then and, and or and and signs. You make your decisions, you think through your most important decisions in life in sentences, in your head. And that's how I think we should approach even philosophy of logic. That's how Aristotle did it. Uh, but very few philosophers of logic to this day even understand Aristotelian philosophy, uh, logic. Aren't our brains faster than like, sentences in our head? Like, we don't have to actually... They're faster, words. yeah. I wouldn't, and I'm no, yeah, I'm no uh, cognitive scientist, but... Pretty sure we can. We all think. I mean, you can also think in, in all sorts of different. Think without words. But um, goodness, how we think well, that would that would be quite a topic to. Uh, <laughs> thinking about thinking, meta thinking. Knowing. What is the cogito? What is its importance, and how is existentialism an inversion of this maxim? All right, I think. Oh, so that just be actually. Exactly. Let's uh, yeah, let's just leave it at that because I already gave you this and it's just obvious enough. It's tied in there. Hopefully, it's obvious enough. Um, oh, so he actually brings up here Socrates' other image for himself as the uh, the, the midwife. The Socrates also calls himself the midwife because he is helping those whom he speaks to allegorically give birth to their own conclusions. Socrates does not propose to teach anything. He talks with you, he asks you questions to help you come to realize what you already know. So anyway, that's just brought up there in passing. He brings up Hegel again here as, uh, as who claims to have knowledge of the whole of reality. But of course, we're rebelling against uh, existentialism rebels against that this notion that one's perfectly rationalistic system can have it all figured out. That's an important point here, actually, before we get to the code itself. He says, we do not ordinarily say a man is a lover, even if he knows all about love, unless he does, in fact, love. And indeed, the more he loves, the less confidence he is likely to have in any theory about love. For Socrates, philosophy was a way of life, and he existed in that way. This is Kierkegaard's uh, fascination with Socrates the man. This is how he lived. This was his approach to life. Philosophy, as we talked about in the very first week of the course, is what again, etymology, the etymology of it? The love of wisdom. The love of wisdom. 
So our author, the author of this book here, our textbook, is pointing out the same thing. That you do not call someone a lover if he knows all about something. That's not fundamentally what a love is. It is not a batch of knowledge. It's a mode of existence. It's a way of life. That was Socrates' way of life. Kierkegaard sees that as the, uh, the way to do it. And what is love about anyway? Is it, a, is it about love or, it is about, or is it about what is loved? You know, you think about a... Have you ever heard the phrase, oh, that person... It's often used in reference to maybe middle school girls. She's uh, in love with love. What does that mean? The concept? She's just... The concept, yeah. The concept, yeah. yeah. Okay, it's new to her, maybe. Yeah. Right. I was just going to say the idea of it. The idea of it. Um, which is a compliment or a criticism? Oh. Oh. I, I would say criticism, <laughs> because, because love is not supposed to be about being in love with the idea of love. It's supposed to be about the specific person. And if you're to say that someone's in love with love is to say they're missing the point entirely. They just like this idea of ooh, dating and like whatever. Um, that's kind of that, that's stupid. It's about a bad person. So are they envious of, of like somebody else who actually loves they try perhaps. to perhaps take somebody perhaps else? Perhaps that is that is their perhaps that's the origin of it, maybe. But it's whatever it is, whatever the origin, it's it's missing the point entirely. And that's what rationalist philosophy does. You can say it's missing the point. All right. He had to, therefore, engage in a sweeping polemic against Hegelian philosophy. Hegel was simply the spokesman for the whole tradition of Western philosophy. Hegel was a very great philosopher. Kierkegaard, however, was a greater man. <laughs> That's directly from our textbook. And uh, I love the claims that this guy will make. And I, I think he's right. Um, so, philosophy can forget, just like the middle school girl maybe who's in love with love. So, Hegel forgets what philosophy is about. Hegel the man who knows. But Hegel's philosophy forgets what philosophy really is. And this doesn't just happen with philosophy. You know, I've had... Um, this happens definitely in theology. I, uh, when I started a seminary, I had some theology professors who were about as unholy as they come, <laughs> and, it's, and as rude and un, just clearly not act. And the point of theology is supposed to be to study God, religion, which is supposed to, the whole point of studying God is supposed to purpose of that is not to make you win arguments about God. The purpose of studying God is to hopefully be able to love God more. That which is known more may be loved more. Uh, Faith-seeking understanding. But so many who study theology miss the point of theology by completely failing to love God more, despite how much more they know. You, uh, we see this, it's brought up somewhere in this chapter. The point being that the ordinary peasant is likely to be holier than the great theological scholar. Same thing with philosophy, though. You can a better philo- an ordinary peasant could be a better philosopher than a supposed scholar in philosophy. All right. So Hegel, he says, was speaking out loud the hidden presuppositions of Western philosophy since its very beginning, even with the Greeks. When Hegel says the real is the rational and the rational is the real, he is being that mouthpiece. The process is still going on today, this author says, meaning when this book was published. In somewhat more subtle fashion, under the names of under the names of science and positivism, without invoking the blessing of Hegel at all. So people usually you won't see people all obsessed with Hegel anymore. His era, his his day is past. But Nothing has actually changed, is what this author is saying. They're still infatuated with this idea in philosophy today that the real is the rational and the rational is the real. If it can't fit within some nice, neat, mechanical, deterministic, maybe even materialistic, rational, philosophical system, it's not worth considering. It doesn't exist. It doesn't even have a vote. Okay. Now, where does this really begin, though, in the modern era, before Hegel begins with Descartes? 
And that's the question here. Reason becoming omnipotent would generate existence out of itself. Now remember, the point of existentialism is to emphasize the primacy of existence. So to suppose that existence is generated by something other than existence is to completely overturn the central premise of existentialism, and that's exactly Descartes' mission. His most famous quote, I've said it before, but maybe only briefly in passing in this class, those who haven't before might remember it, what is the cogito? Maybe the most famous quote in modern philosophy. I think therefore I am. I think therefore I am. I think therefore I am. This maybe is even more than the real is the rational, the rational is the real, is the single sentence that existentialism rebels against the most. You can, there are entire careers today spent considering that statement, uh, which is ridiculous. But what is... Do they consider why they're considering it? And then they consider why they're considering that they're considering it. And then they keep going on forever, just like they can't realize how ridiculous can't they are. Can't they ever be existential just blame the <laughs> truth for themselves? They can't. That's the thing. They only, many people lack the ability to see how they look from the outside. Most people. Um, what is this saying? Thought. What, so I am. That's referring to the existence. In other words, they're saying existence is, if this is a causal process, then what's the effect? Existence. Ex existence. So I think therefore I exist. Yeah. Now, it's basically what it means. that's the fundamental error of, uh, well, Cartesian dualism. Well, I shouldn't say dualism, that's a separate question of the Cartesian approach is to not put existence first, but to suppose that existence somehow needs to be derived from something outside of itself, specifically thought, right here. So this would be cause. And this, what even is it? This thinking, well, we uh, don't really know what we're even doing when we're thinking, to be honest. We do it all the time. For Descartes, we somehow, in, De in Descartes' argument, we know more about thinking than we do about concrete existence, which is crazy. I can say a lot more about my hand than I can say about what the heck I'm doing when I'm thinking. Thinking is much more of a mystery to us than concrete existence. It seems like, based, like it's based in Plato, but pushed just far down the line. It, you're right. Descartes does take some inspiration from Plato. Um, he's not a Platonist, but you're, you're definitely correct in saying that there's an inspiration in that. Which is why Alfred North Whitehead, a, a, a recent philosopher, said all of Western philosophy, is, all of Western philosophy is a series of footnotes on Plato. Plato <laughs> did kind of just set the stage for all the questions that have been considered in philosophy. Um, so what is the, how is this different from existentialism? Well, existentialism. says, first, I am. Then, it thinks about this given existence. which is actually rather intuitive, and it's kind of funny it took this long for a philosophy to explicitly say that. I mean, it did, this, this has been said before existentialism, but for a philosophy to really focus on it. Even Aristotle, who's considered not almost an anti-existentialist, who knows not, specifically said that existence is our first and greatest good. Aristotle would never condone this Cartesian assertion, I think, therefore I am. Now, I know when you, in ordinary parlance, when you hear this, most people just think this is advice to, like, think, which, and that's fine, like, if this, is, <laughs> if this is just advice to think, then sure, and that's how most people take it, but that's not at all what Descartes is talking about. He's talking about that the only way he can even generate his existence is through the thought, 
So this is the self-reflection. So what does thinking actually make you? So imagine I think before I am A, what? All it makes you, here's the thing, it wraps you up in radical doubt. If you cannot begin with the I am and go from there, you're stuck in what some modern critics, rightfully so, have called the Cartesian circle. You're at, you are wrapped up in radical skepticism and you can't, you can't actually grant anything. It's, um, There's a reason why I think. I mean, whatever that reason is, that determines what I am, right? Yeah, and well, you are before you ever think about it. You, and that, in fact, it's helpful that we're doing this in English, not Latin. To even say cogito in the first place, cogito ergo sum would be the Latin. To even say I think, you need to first say I. I. <laughs> you're, you're, even Descartes didn't realize he's already taking his own existence for granted in the very first, uh, in the very first part of that assertion that he's supposedly not taking existence for granted. In. Now the whole reason for this. Descartes is just terrified of the possibility of error. He's, 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 a par he's probably schizophrenic. He's paranoid that he might be wrong on something. And how do we come to know things? We see them, we hear them, and then we think about them. Like that's how we come to know things. Uh, but since if you trace back any of that knowledge far enough, it always goes back to the senses. Anything you know, you can trace back its logical progression to something you interact with with the senses. That one, it's not hard to do. Because you can do that, why was Descartes so paranoid about the possibility of error in everything he thought he knew? Because the sense is... Fallible? Yeah. Not imperfect. It's imperfect, perfect. yeah. But here's the thing. He, and I would just, you don't have to have any of this down, I'll never test you on this, but he goes way too far in his rejection of the senses. Is the omniscience like perfection of the senses? Or like Omniscience would be all knowingness. Um, so we're, we certainly don't have that. But is that like perfection of the senses in a way, or per per perfection of your knowledge? Or it would be the perfection. It would be the perfection of knowledge. Yeah. Or imagination. So Descartes puts a stick into the water. That's his famous example. That those of you who had it before have heard already. And what's the exit? What's his crisis there? It seems bent. And what's the resolution, the simple resolution that for some reason Descartes never thought of? Just feel the stick. Just feel it. <laughs> and then, so here's the thing. Descartes, Descartes' whole argument is, and I'm not saying he's totally going to have to do with the stick, I'm just using an example right now, is that, oh shoot, the stick really isn't bent, but my senses tell me it is. Therefore, I cannot trust my senses at all. Well, you have another sense. Yeah, for, that's the thing. How do you know the stick isn't bent? Your your, it's a circular argument. Sense of its conclusion is presupposed in its premise. He's assuming the stick isn't bent. Why is he assuming it isn't bent? It's nothing bent. Maybe it is bent. It maybe, maybe, the, maybe water just bends things. He put it inside here, he had it outside of the water. So yeah, he, even if he didn't take it out of the water. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's assuming it's bent. Assuming the stick isn't bent, and that's his entire logical grounds for insisting the senses are in error, and yet the only reason he actually has to suppose the stick is not bent, for the furrow, because again, for all he knows the water does bend, he's, he's pretending he doesn't know anything, for all he knows the water does bend the stick, is that he can put his hand in there even while the, wa even while the stick is in the water and feel that it is not bent. In other words, he is deferring to a what to refute the what. So he's, deferring, he's deferring to the authority of the senses to try to refute the authority of the senses, which makes no sense. And somehow he never realized that's what he was doing. He has all these other examples. Oh, I see a building in the distance. It looks circular. You could do this at Union College. But I walk up closely to it, and it's what? Not circular. It's, a, it's like a, or it's like a hexagon, yeah, like a, some sort of polygon. But in, even in that case, He's trying to refute the authority of the senses by deferring to the authority of the senses yet again. So what would we say to something like dye that like dissolves in water? What would we say for something like that? That it's so the what what's the conundrum with it? Like you have a solid that you put in the water, it immediately dissolves and disappears. Uh -huh. So the fusion. It seems so the senses seem to think it disappeared. Yeah, so would that how would he argue that? When you go off feeling the site or he the, hmm. Taste it? 
<laughs> yeah, well, that's the, that's one thing. You could, the sense is better. Well, I was saying that's anything that kind of argument. Yeah, no, that's that's the thing. That would kind of, I think, be an example of his argument. That the senses would be would seem to be an error there. But how do you conclude that it did not disappear? Well, you have to still, even in that case, defer to some other sense. You can't use di- sight directly, but you could use um, you could taste it. It was like, it was like red dye in your hand and like the water turns red. So it would still be there, but it... You'd use, you'd use some... You know, even in our modern technological age where most scientific observations are made with incredibly precise instruments so we can see things that we could never see with the naked eye, what do we still have to do, even with these instruments? See through the we have to see them. We have to see what they tell us. Well, we, no, yeah. uses the senses. That's what the thing. What would say something like that if senses that, aren't accurate? You just the, so what I mean I'm not so the sense all the sense of sight there tells you is that you can't see it anymore. I mean so that I mean but that wouldn't really be wrong, would it? I'm just trying to figure out what he like he's saying that you can't trust senses. So would you still say it's there even though we can't see it anymore? You, you Technically, can't. you see it. You're just not actually seeing. Does that make any sense? I hope that makes sense. That's, no, water, that's so. a very interesting example. I'm just trying to figure out how it, whether it fits into supporting Descartes or refuting. I don't know. Because <laughs> um, you had to take an extra step further in order to try and prove it that it was still there. Like if it was, well, like, if it was like sugar dissolving in water, it's like you have to take an extra step in order. to prove that the sugar is in the water still. Yeah, yeah. Saturated. And then, I mean, the general, we could think of examples forever, and I think each one would prove that you can never actually reject the authority of the senses without deferring to the very thing you're trying to reject. Every example where the senses are in error relies upon further investigation, revealing through more sense input that the senses are not in error. And that, 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 the, that the sense originally was in error, based on further sense input. So the point is, Yes, of course, we all know that an individual sense of an individual time can sometimes mislead us. We've all seen, I used to love those books, those pictures when I was a kid. I haven't seen them around as often. You look at them and they look like just a mess of like, shapes and stuff. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I can't remember what these are called. They used to be all the rage in the 90s. Are they just uh, called puzzle books? No, no, well, like, illusion. Yeah, they're, they're an optical illusion of some sort, where it's like a post, it's usually a poster um, on the wall. Um, magic Eye. Uh, magic Eye? Okay, yeah, so you look, at first glance, it looks like just a bunch of shapes, but if you, like, look at it long enough and then give a little cross out or something, this other image, like, pops out of it. It's crazy. And you don't actually believe that there's something physically there. Your sense, your eye, you could say, is fooling you in that moment, but your senses are not actually fooling you. Because if you did the same thing I did when I was a kid and first saw this, you did what? Yeah, you tried to grab it, <laughs> the thing, but it wasn't there. And you knew because you also have something called the common sense. And I'm not talking in the general sense of the word, like, now I'm talking about more specific. Common sense, traditionally, is what the medieval philosophers especially would say, coordinates and unifies the inputs from the five senses to present to your mind an actual uh, meaningful image. Sometimes you've had sense input without the common sense actually succeeding in that case, and it just looks, you can't, you don't even know what you're looking at. So that like magic, I think the whole... Maybe, yeah, so maybe sometimes in that case, but and sometimes like, but have you ever looked at something and you just honestly don't even know what you're looking at? Like it's, it just looks like a mess of colors. It's not that your thinking is messed up, it's not that your eye is messed up, it's just it hasn't formed anything. Like, it's, it's like a dream. Kind of like a dream, but it's, a, but it's real life. Like, sometimes a, a, an awkwardly drawn picture painting does this, where it's clearly supposed to be of like a tree or a house, but your mind is not receiving that, even though you are, re- even though you are seeing it. Is this, is this, so has anyone experienced this before? And then suddenly, you, oh, that, I see it now. And then you, that's when your common sense kicks in. But I'm not talking about the general common sense we usually speak of. Like, so it would be like if I said there's a face in the chalkboard, but like a razor mark right there. You would yeah. have to try making sense of it. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Your your common sense can automatically and intuitively make sense of the raw input from your senses to generate to your mind something that is actually intelligible. Um, so anyway, what I'm going with that is the yes, individual senses can be an error at times, but 
it, we cannot reject the senses as categorically, systematically misleading because all of our knowledge eventually boils down to something we receive from the senses. The general input of the senses with the common sense over time has to be considered as authoritative. Why? That's part of our givens. That's part of our existential givens. The general input from the senses. The authority of the senses. Existentialism says, first I am, then it thinks about this given existence, acknowledging, among many other things, I just want to throw this on the board now since we're talking about Descartes' Koji stuff, acknowledging the authority of the senses. Is that for the third question? This is for the Koji's over. That's not really talked about too much right there in the book at some point today, but I wanted to give you that background now. Moving along here. Uh, there was nothing recondite about the kind of existence for which Kierkegaard and refuting Hegel thought such a brilliant and passionate battle. Recondite means obscure or arcane. It was simply our ordinary human existence, concrete, personal, and finite which he saw reason on the point of ingesting into itself. You all have lives. You all know things. You all know people. You all, have, you all see things and hear things. You all have common sense. Those are... Rationalism, in other words, has no right to overturn that. It has no right to, quote, ingest all of that into itself and try to, in a word, annihilate it. Reason's offense, therefore, was a religious one for Kierkegaard. Because Christianity, for him, was through and through a personalistic. God bless you. God bless you. Why is that? Um, this, is, this is especially the case for Christianity, but it's the case for other religions as well. It's called the scandal of particularity. It has scandalized philosophers for a long time. Why? What is, what, has anyone you probably haven't heard the phrase scandal of particularity before, but what might that be getting at? How could something so universal and absolute be so historically specific? Christianity says that the truth is a person, that goodness is a person. Um, that is scandalous to a philosopher who wants purely abstract ideas and, and abstract reason. So it's a, it's a, uh, this rationalism is, has plenty of problems of its own right that we've been talking about for a long time, but for Kierkegaard, its biggest offense is a religious one. It wants, to, so it wants to ingest all of the so-called scandalous particularities of Christianity into itself. It wants to say well, all that historical stuff, miracles and, and the person of Jesus and all that stuff, that's kind of just, I don't know, maybe myths or just don't worry about it. I, we have this philosophical system for you that will give you everything you need. Did you have a question? No. Uh, um, so this is getting to the next question there, his issue with the Danish church of his day that it wasn't really Christian in his mind. It was Hegelian. All right, reason's defense was a religious one to Kierkegaard because Christianity for him was through and through a personalistic religion depending upon a historical incarnation and a historical revelation and could not be understood purely under the aspect of eternity, meaning abstract eternal truths. It, require, it requires acknowledgement of historical specifics. Hegel, on the other hand, still called himself a Christian but believed that philosophy encompassed religion and made the religious truth a mere symbolic approximation of philosophical truth. So Hegel, remember, everything has to fit into his philosophical system. If everything needs to fit into his philosophical system, that means that his philosophical system itself may not what? Fit into anything else if everything else fits into it. So, for a system to propose itself as so absolute and universal is essentially for a philosophical system to assert itself as superior to religion. That's what Kierkegaard sees as Hegelianism doing, and that's what Kierkegaard sees as the Danish church rolling over to. 
So what we have is this little dynamic here. Um, I'm going to try to make sense of this in the board. First, let's just have down that he saw it as Hegelianism in disguise. Again, I think that the video we watched made it look too much like he just was categorically rejecting these things and wanted people to stop going to church and just be existential, life-hating, uh, individualistic Christians. That's not what Kierkegaard's going for. He's just he's being critical about a very specific way of uh, doing Christianity that he saw in the church of his day and age. He saw this Hegelianism in disguise, where the rationalist philosophical approach was deemed superior. Okay. So, why would someone want to do that to Christianity, then? Why? That's probably hard to read. Let me say that one more time. He saw this Hegelianism in disguise, where the rationalist philosophical approach was deemed superior. To what? Well, to what Christianity is and must be in its essence, Kierkegaard says. Um, but let's pause for a moment and consider what the motivation for this might be. What is easier to follow? A person or an ideology? A person. We have one vote for person. Ideology. Yeah, person. Yeah. We have another vote for ideology. No right or wrong answer to this. I'm just curious to see your thoughts. What is easier to follow, a person or an ideology? Can, can I explain really why? Like person? I, I would agree with person just because like, an ideology is it, like, it's more intrinsic to yourself. Okay. And, you know, yeah, like your interpretation of it. Like, like it's more kind of say like absolute. It's absolute. I suppose. But I'd say a person is based on their ideology. Here's the thing. Well, the first well, I don't know if I'm asking the question. You can right. still follow the ideology. Uh huh. Okay. Did you have a thought? I feel like person, yeah. Because okay. I feel like if they had personality, you would be more likely to follow them than just like an ideology. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, so it's. That's what if the ideology comes from the person? And it's the person. Then I, well, that's, that's, that's the thing. Let's, let's, okay, let's zero in on that for a moment. I kind of, I think I botched that. Because um, I was, here's what I was going for. And I agree with what you guys are saying, but the point in this particular, maybe it, it can't work as a general question because it's too specific to this case. An ideology is something that you can much more easily grasp. Grasp, so, yeah. It's like a natural. Persons are, na are intrinsically it's mysterious. Intrinsic, yeah. and persons are always more mysterious than any idea. Um, an ideology is something that you can claim nominal adherence to while actually doing what? You can just you can twist it, right? You can twist it to your own device. You can make it basically mean whatever you want it to mean. You can you can uh, modify it conveniently while still claiming adherence to it in name. You can <clears throat> find all sorts of loopholes. You can uh, you can technically follow the rules but actually be breaking the real spirit of them and the real meaning of them, if you're just talking about an ideology. When you have a person there saying, don't do that or do that, it's easier in one sense if it's a good person, it's, you're inspired. So if you're, you want to follow a good person, you, you want uh, these things. And hopefully the person is, is inspirational and good and moral and all those things. But it's also, in a, in a way, harder, right? In the sense that you can't wiggle out of anything that's, that's made clear to you by that person. You are duty bound if you're really devoted to a person. And what Kierkegaard sees, I thought, I thought you were asking like, how could you gain more followers? And oh yes, yeah, more followers from a person. Yeah. yeah, it's easier to have a whole movement. Next, I will say like my answer is individual as far as like I can follow ideology better than a person, but I will say overall and looking back, you definitely follow people more than ideology. It's look, more look, effective. Look, 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 yeah. yeah, exactly. Right, it's more effective if you have a specific person. So, and that's the case, well that's, um, 
you know, look at uh, that, and that's certainly the religions that have spread the most have been primarily based in person. You know, obviously Christianity, as we we're talking about here, but also Islam. Folks, is, I mean, Muhammad's not considered divine or anything in Islam, but he's the prophet, the prophet for them. Mm -hmm. So he's the the inspiration for them to follow. Yeah, he's chill. Yeah, he's he's a big deal in Islam. Uh, <laughs> Hinduism, on the other hand, it doesn't really spread. It's more of a distillation of Indian culture. It's an ideology, it's a philosophy, it's a set of worship. It doesn't really spread. I mean, yes, it does a bit, but nothing like the other religions based on the person do. Um, it's big, because India is big, but... Confu and yeah, that... Well, here's the thing. Confucius himself was awesome, but he wasn't... Um, he didn't claim any, any special status for himself. He didn't even claim to be a prophet or anything. He just had this set of ethical norms, which made a lot of sense. And, and, uh, but even that didn't really spread outside of China as much. So the point here is that Kierkegaard sees the Danish church as morphing it from a person, based on the person of Jesus, into the ideology of, quote, Christian philosophy, which really had ceased to be Christian. It had turned into a tool for just kind of the easy conscience of the age. Just justify anything. Whoa, that! Oh my! God. Yeah, that's ah, so. Wow. He's oh he um, he's not. He's, he's he's as Christian as they come. He's not at all rejecting, and he's not even saying Christian philosophy is bad. He you, you, he would be. He is a Christian philosopher, but he's saying the Christian philosophy, if it is to exist, must not strive to subsume into itself the other aspects of religion, but rather it must be what? The servant. It must be a part of the theology. It must be a part of the religion. It must be simply uh, a means to the end of being a better, oops, insert religion here, or Christianity, a better Christian, not vice versa. So we have this dichotomy here. Let me, this will be the last thing I have time for here. Let me try and, and, uh, <clears throat> make sense of this. The Hegelian Danish church approach that, that uh, Kierkegaard sees, the supreme principle in it is reason. The supreme principle in religion as Kierkegaard sees it, right, this would be revelation. It's an existential given. So this is my existential given, Kierkegaard would say. I proceed from that. Is that, is that along with the so this, if, we, if we can fit it in, this goes with the Danish church criticism here. Um, what does reason come from? Well, we have theories. This is gold. We have fallibility of human thought. And again, I'm giving you this from Kier I know you, a lot of people won't agree with how he's putting it, but this is Kierkegaard's concern in a nutshell. Fallibility of human thought. On the other hand, the revelation side here proceeds from some existential given existence. That is, of course, is often disputed, what exactly is the existential given there, but at least starting with the given. And if it is indeed revelation, of course, that itself is disputed, but if it is a revelation, then its contents are themselves individual givens, and therefore they are indisputable. This comes from the authority of the senses. The early Christians did not engage in lengthy philosophical disputations to try and uh, ascertain Jesus' divinity. It was the miracles that caused them to believe in it. And what does that require? Because you are not directly validating the conclusions with your own reason, to nevertheless grant them is a, this is his probably biggest teaching, leap, leap of faith. It's not arbitrary or irrational. That's not the point here. That would be irrationalism of Nietzsche or Schopenhauer or someone else. The point is not that it's irrational. The point is simply that it is beyond rationalistic philosophy's ability to completely define it on its own. And that fundamentally, at the end of the day, it is this that makes you who you are, what you've done your leap of faith for. 
a leap of faith is like causing an accident. That accident creates a miracle or like uh, an amazing thing, perhaps. Yeah, it's when you are most free. It is when you are most you, and your destiny hinges upon that leap of faith, your choice to make it. That's what Kierkegaard says. He's begging Christians to make that leap. Uh, I don't think he's, he's not rejecting Christian philosophy, he's just saying it's kind of secondary to, to, to the, the leap itself. Do it or you're not with it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he would probably say most Christians of his day, at least, at least the most of the ones he knew, didn't make it. Yeah. They didn't do that leap of faith. It was kind of just a maybe a theory for them. Maybe that's there for me when I need it. Maybe I'll go to church on Sundays and I don't know. Uh, so he's he's intense. He's severely critical, but uh, he's got some, some some good points. I think that's so. There's our man Kierkegaard. We don't have time to finish the unit, of course, here in person. Oh man! But we'll finish it online. I will see you guys online. <laughs> don't worry. We'll be in touch. Very much so. Just digitally, and it, it will work out just fine. So. But anyway, let's philosophize. All right, so Kierkegaard. Um, the, uh, we already talked about a couple of things in Kierkegaard discussion sheet. One, why did Kierkegaard need to, quote, oppose intelligence? Just for those who missed this real quick, I'll jot it down. Not because it is bad in itself. It's not. But Kierkegaard says, without faith, Intelligence causes one to die inside his own mind. Tell us how it works. Faith is. There you go. There's, there's, that would also be a uh, relevant thing for Kierkegaard, certainly becoming a Christian for him without works. Wait, faith without works is dead. But yeah, that would be scriptural there. Without faith, intelligence causes one to die inside. His own mind. Why? Why don't you that do that? Well, again, Kierkegaard has good lessons whether or not you put faith in this blank. You, there's something else that you need fundamentally to guide your life other than just supposing you can figure it all out and just go with the conclusions you come up with. Without faith, intelligence will to die inside and not mind. Because there's way too much to figure out. And even when you think you have figured something out, you probably haven't. So, it's great. Keep trying to figure things out. We can figure out a lot, but we can't figure it all out. And if we suppose we can, you're just endlessly going to be restless. Because before you do anything in your life, you're going to want to what? You're going to want to make sure that you know it is the absolutely correct thing to do. But you can't. You can't be so sure about everything. Has anyone ever heard of Buridan's ass? Buridan's donkey? I, I, I wish I'd got this ready. I don't. It would take me too long to find it. It's this great image. It's a donkey, and it's uh, perfectly in between two bales of hay. Both bales of hay are the exact same size, the exact, they're identical, and it's the same distance from them. What do you think happens? It's a parable. He picks one, doesn't he? What's that? He would just pick one over the other. Problem is, he can't figure out which one to pick, because they're both the same, and he's equidistant from both of them. And it's the same hay, same size, same shape, so what does this poor donkey do? He starves. starves to death. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, you're going to put yourself in that, in that very situation if you uh, think that you have to, with your intelligence, figure everything out before you start moving. You need something deeper and more existential to make your most fundamental choices in life. This does not mean contradict reason. It just means don't depend upon it to figure out every single thing for you. All right, so we talked about that a lot last class, but moving on here. The central fact, we also covered that. The world once revolved around Christ, but is essentially no longer Christian. In other words, it was having an identity crisis. The world once revolved around Christ, but was essentially no longer Christian. That was what Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard identified as the primary fact of the world, the age in which we lived, which is certainly the age in which we live. So the modern era. All right, so skipping past that. The thinker whose thought is central is always attuned to some urgent question of his time, of which the time itself is not aware. 
Kierkegaard goes for the jugular. This is one explanation of his power over us today. The greatest thinkers, he's saying here, are those who are urgently fixated upon a question, a concern, an issue that their own age, their own peers, are not even aware is an issue. In other words, the greatest thinkers are what? We say this looking back, because we can't see the future. You know something? They're prophetic. They're, well, when you call someone prophetic, maybe you mean it literally. Maybe you mean you literally get messages from heaven. But probably you mean it figuratively. That they, what? Can tell the future. But yeah, that, not that they, of course, don't know it, that no one knows their future, but that they were so spot on in their concerns, in their uh, thinking, that they were able to, well, diagnose a disease only in its infancy, to use a very relevant uh, analogy here. It's like, it's like if one of us had coronavirus, Kierkegaard would just know it, even if we had no symptoms. He wouldn't. <laughs> not literally. But that's what he sees with society. He sees the problem. And he's not trying, but the thing is, remember, he's not trying to fix society. He's trying to fix what? Himself. Individual. All that, and he's not even really trying to fix other individuals. He's just like he's, he's basically like a blogger. He's just being public with his own interior struggle. He's writing it down on paper, and all he really cares about is becoming an authentic human being, being absolutely true to his existence. Which for Kierkegaard is becoming a Christian, is his absolute existential fundamental struggle. I'm going to get to the next question in a minute here, but there's a few things I have highlighted from the reading first. So it said he did not take up the problem of Christianity because history, civilization, and Western man were at issue. No. For Kierkegaard, it was a thoroughly personal one. He had chosen to be a Christian, and he had constantly to renew this choice with all the energy and passion of his being. Nearly all of his writing is the lyric of Kierkegaard, the man, frankly and validly an act of self-expression. Here, the existentialists are happy to are quick to point this out that what whatever we produce is an act of our existence. A human being can never be just a cog in a wheel. A human being can never just kind of in a robot-like way undertake a task given to it in a purely objective way. Because everything you do is a human act. Every single thing you do, you are giving voice to your existence. Kierkegaard does not merely tell us that being precedes thought, or that all thought is an expression of some concrete being. He shows us this truth in the flesh, as it were, by showing us a thought that is without disguise an act of being, of his own personal and passionate existence. He never aimed at being a philosopher, and all his philosophy was indeed incidental to his main purpose. Incidental, we know that is, it doesn't mean accidental. Uh, incidentalism just means secondary. It comes along, it's not, the, it's not the primary intended effect if something is incidental. So he's saying here, Kierkegaard, yeah, he was a philosopher, but his philosophy was incidental to his main purpose. That is, to show what it means to be a Christian, or rather, for him to try to become one. Even showing other people what it means to be a Christian was incidental to his really primary task, which is completely for himself, becoming a Christian. Whatever that whatever that means in its in its deepest way. So, what's that? That's the that's the goal. That's doubtless what he's hoping for. Yeah, is that if you are fully authentic to yourself, you can't directly fix anyone. You can fix a car, because a car doesn't need to what for you to fix it. it doesn't need to, to burn or change. Yeah, it it doesn't need to consent. Consent. It doesn't need to cooperate. It's just there, and you can fix it. Uh, you can't fix another person. You can help them. But you can't fix them because they need to, it needs, the, the solution needs to flow from within themselves. That's, e even with our body, that's true enough. You really got to cooperate with the doctor if you want to he get healed. But much more uh, true, and much more deeply with the, with the mind, the soul. That's completely a matter of your own cooperation. You, you know, you can pop a pill for a while and think that, that fixes it, but it's not going to. It's, it's got to come from within yourself. And I'm not saying there's no place for those things. I'm not a psychiatrist. They're saying we can't, we can't place our trust, not open. So, what he's saying then, what's implicit in this, is when we go about producing works, in whatever context, that have nothing to do with our, that are not sincere 
results of our existence. I know this is abstract, but the point is to try to make it as concrete as possible. That you are who you are, and everything you do must proceed from that. And when what you do does not proceed from that, what do we call such an act? What do we name an act that someone undertakes that does not genuinely proceed? Natural. Unnatural, what did he say? Hypocritical. Hypocritical, certainly. Any other names we might give to that? Not disingenuine. Not genuine, absolutely. Inauthentic, duplicitous. This has come up before. Um, we all do a bunch of things in our lives. We all have to wear multiple hats, that's fine. But whenever you say that someone has two blank, that's always a criticism, rightfully so. Two what? Faces. Two faces. Don't have two faces. You can't do that. That's going to mess you up. You can't just turn off your existence and treat yourself as just a body that can just do things. It, oh, you're, oh, whatever you do, it's you doing it. So this is, um, I'm to just personally here, this is why in all my philosophy classes, I, uh, I give my students so many options for what they want to write a paper on. I, I, I hate the thought of... Uh, being forced into this completely narrow uh, assignment for a, for a long, five pages long, somewhat long, for a, for a significant paper, because if it's something that means absolutely nothing to you, and you couldn't care less about, and maybe you even have a, an issue with on principle, to have to go and write a paper on it, that would not be very authentic. And I would never want to ask that of you. I would never want to make you engage hour after hour in something that you can't even find a way to engage in as a legitimate, authentic act of your existence. So, uh, yeah, I make you write a paper, but I try to give you so many options that hopefully anybody in the face of the planet would care about at least one of the uh, important questions on the various discussion sheets. It's very important to be authentic. What, uh, when do we get into that? Like if Anytime you want. Okay. Just write, start picking away. All, all these questions in the top of those sheets, you can answer as many of them or as few of them as you want. And um, as long as your thoughts add up to 1,500 words, you're done. Yeah. What about the most recent discussion seat that was like completely opinionized that you had? Yeah, that's, just that's a pretty open-ended question. And whatever from that discussion. And you don't have, remember, you don't have to answer you still all of this. Yeah. yeah. This discussion oh, yeah. For yeah. Oh, uh, you, you could do your whole paper on just one discussion sheet question, or you could write a few sentences on each and have that up to how long? The uh, 1500 word. Would that be? 1500 words, which is about five pages. Cool. Um, and yeah, that's not due until the end of the semester. Well, second to last Friday. If we're here. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's submitted online anyway. I know. Okay. So, so yeah, there's a. So, but I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to take your advice to the philosophers here, and certainly. You know, it always runs me the wrong way when I see any employer. And look, we, we, there's jobs we got to do. I'm not trying to be impractical here. But it always annoys me when I see employers forgetting that their employees are human beings that, like, are a certain way. And when you demand, when as an employer you go demanding these specific superficial demeanors from people that just aren't them, I don't know, that, that's, that's not, I'm not saying that's downright abuse or anything, but I don't find it, I, I, don't, I don't think it's right either. Um, I don't know, I think of these waiters and waitresses at places where they have these like specific ordeals that they're forced to engage in any time of someone's birthday. You know those places you have to, have to mm -hmm. just, I mean, sure, encourage your employees to be joyful and, and kind, that's good, but I don't know. It just gets to the point where you're forgetting that, you, that your employee is a person when, when you go making such specific demands of them and how exactly they behave. Because they can't, they, you know, we always have to be, we, we have to, always have to be true to our deepest selves. So, uh, be, we can be practical with that, but I think we, we need to make sure not to completely abandon this insight Kierkegaard has here either. Kierkegaard's power over us today, he says, the author says, lies neither in his own intelligence nor in his battle against the imperialism of intelligence, to use, a form, to use that formula with which we began, but in the religious and the human passion of the man himself. We open a book, as Pascal says, sort of back to the last unit, expecting to encounter an author, and instead we meet a man. 
Even to those for whom Christianity is a mournful echo of a dead past, Kierkegaard can still make, in Karl Jasper's phrase, an appeal to their own existence. Being a Christian, after all, is one way of being a man. For Kierkegaard, personally, it was the only way. And to have this way illumined, to be summoned to its tasks, it is also to be called on to be a man, however divergent our own choice of a way may be. So we dedicate so much of our effort to trying to become a blank, insert some career into that blank. That seems to be what most of our energy is spent on. But what about becoming a person? Well, you're already a person, yes, but what about becoming a flourishing person? What does that entail? What does being a completely authentic and flourishing person entail? What if whatever career you're dedicating yourself to now disappears in five years? So a lot of careers today in the world dis disappear with, with each passing year, it seems. Um, who are you then? Well, hopefully, you'll, hopefully you know, and hopefully you live authentically in accordance with that. That's what he's saying here. OK, so during his lifetime, he met with an unfriendly press. It says here he was not treated kindly by the uh, media of his day. He was a rather strange-looking fellow, as Socrates himself was. Socrates also was mocked by the uh, media of his day, which did exist. It wasn't in the form it is now. It was the Greek theater. And they certainly made fun of his, his own existential crisis, which he was completely open about, because that's, remember, that's his... That's his writing, is to be completely, to lay bare the, the, the man inside, which most people cover with many masks. And this is not something that only the media of his day made fun of him for, but it's something that recent psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic critics have as well. They've tried to psychoanalyze Kierkegaard from 100 years removed. Um, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with psychoanalysis here. In fact, there's a uh, great uh, existential therapy created by Viktor Frankl, an existential thinker. But anyway, but the problem here is when one tries to analyze an event purely objectively, that is actually fundamentally a subjective phenomenon. Recent psychoanalytic critics have clumsily wielded their scalpels upon Kierkegaard in an effort to cut the man down to size in order, apparently, to cut down his thought. Much too much mystification has been made of one decisive event of a human and emotional nature in a life that was otherwise one of dedicated uneventfulness, is what they will say. So in other words, that one event for Kierkegaard that he kind of overblew in his own mind and made too much of and that kind of messed up his, his thinking would be what? Oh, the broken engagement. Yeah, the broken engagement. So, what they say is that his thoughts rotate too much. This would be how the psychoanalyst criticize him. By saying his thought, and by thought, they don't just mean what's going on in his head, but the thought that he, of course, writes about. That his thought rotates. around one simple emotional event that is overblown. Is it really just one or many? There were doubtless many, but the one that the broken engagement was the real clincher for him. That was his existential choice. That was the moment that he knew there was no turning back from, and that was the most painful thing for him. And so, I should have that down so we don't forget the breaking off of the engagement to Regina Olsen. And this is not normal. I mean, you know, most engagements that are broken off because they realize that one of them is a jerk or uh, there's some external event or something wrong with the, uh, the people involved. 
That, of course, was not the case here. Kierkegaard, on one level, wanted nothing more. On a, on a rather deep level, actually. On a rather deep level. He wanted nothing more. That if you get married, settle down with Virginia, start a family, and live that type of life. But that wasn't what he wanted on the absolutely deepest level. What he wanted on the absolutely deepest level was something that couldn't work with this, couldn't work with that type of life. Again, he's not condemning that type of life, but for him to be completely authentic to who he was at the deepest level, and that's our goal here, is to dig down as deep as we can, to find the very core of our existence in order to be authentic with that, he had to break it off. Sorry to interrupt. No well, problem. Um, my friend de Sesame, who the two of them both dormed together at Albany, uh -huh. just said the uh, dorm advisors told them to bring all their uh, stuff home. Hmm. That's what happened. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't even go to class. I've, I'm there once a week. But. <laughs> uh, I don't live there, thankfully. Um, yeah. Interesting. So with, uh, it's uh, you know it's funny. We started this course talking about what? End of the world. Uh, yeah, existential yeah. crises. <laughs> Finally, we have a real one here to, uh, anybody, to philosophy. Did, did anybody hear about the, the uh, asteroid? There's I heard about that. It's not going to freak me us. out, though, because the lines were like, asteroid's going to hit Earth, kill the whole world. And I was like, happened to us. That would be existential. We haven't told him Don't worry. Under control, yes. Yeah. I know. It's like, <laughs> if you saw like, like posts. Million miles away, yeah. But it's still like relatively close. Could you see the one with like, the oddity posted? It literally says, Impact will destroy the world. Mm -hmm. no, like, yeah, the uh, click the clickbait the clickbait headlines. Yeah. So it's uh, you know it's it's very fitting that we're all in existentialism class here because I th I think that it's fair to say that the events transpiring in the world are causing more people to pause and reflect and ask the deeper questions they've been avoiding for <laughs> for many years probably for their whole life for some people. Uh, this is the time to ask those questions and. Hopefully the answers that you come to will not be affected by anything going on in societal level. Back to my boy he, Kierkegaard. Our boy Kierkegaard. Yeah, so he, he had to be he true to himself. His girl. He, uh, this was emotionally devastating for him, naturally. I, I'm sure you can imagine how devastating that would be. It, again, he said there's nothing at all wrong with Virginia. This, is, this was you know, the ideal woman for him. He, and she very much wanted to get married to him. She's, like, it was actually pretty, uh, really sad what happened after that. Like, she would, I think, spend years, like, begging him to change his mind. Wait, so what exactly, hard. so why didn't he want to marry her? I guess he, he wanted to. No, I know, but so, so why? Because he that's, to, that's the thing. How, yeah. how can you want something so deeply and yet still not do it? Well, it, it's just when there are contradictions you must go with the whichever path is. So if you can't take both. Wait. So what path he wanted to like live the same? What, what was his? He felt. Was his he goal? felt. He his goal. That his mission in life was just to furiously write and and consider and and teach maybe that it wasn't as that that was incidental as we said but it still occurred as to what it was to be a christian and he couldn't do that, he couldn't do that well enough by also getting married and having a family not a, it's there, there are plenty of people who did get married and have families and did a great job doing the same kind of thing Kierkegaard did that's not the point that's a, but that e even looking at it that way it's fine. That's what we need to do that sometimes. But what we're doing it when we analyze a situation like that, we're analyzing it subjectively or objectively. 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 We're looking at it from the outside, and saying, "Well, why? Like, why can't you do this and this, and 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 make that work?" Because he couldn't. Because he subjectively, from the inside, knew that in order to be absolutely authentic to himself, he couldn't do both. He just knew, and no argument. No argument that only describes the objective situation can ever touch on the subject of truth that you just know interiorly. And that's actually the answer here. So that's exactly the answer to how we can address this. All the psychoanalysis we can possibly do of Kierkegaard is only touching at the objective. This attempts 
to understand an event objectively, that can only be understood subjectively. We haven't all gone through such extremes as Kierkegaard, but I, I'm pretty sure we've all experienced this in some degree. The, the younger you are, the more it happens, probably. That uh, you had a moment, you know, some significant event in your life, and you simply knew something in that moment. You just knew it. You knew something you had to do. You knew something about who you were. I don't know. I can't get too detailed about this because of the nature of the discussion at hand. It's subjective. But you just knew it. But then maybe you had a parent or a teacher or, a, or somebody else in a position of authority say, oh no, that was just blank. And they insert some long-winded explanation of what it, what it was. So that was, you were emotional, you were, you know, you had just, I can't. I said in love. In, oh, in love, okay. In love, you were just, you were just, whatever, whatever explanation goes in there. I can't even think of more of them off the top of my head, but just some explanation to try and make you think that it wasn't what you knew it was. I think we've all had that done to us at some point. You're trying to say, like, you're wrong? Yeah, you're wrong. It was, no, that wasn't what you think it was. You don't, you don't know that about yourself. You don't, you, uh... Like your view of like a person or something? Yeah, your view of who you are, what you must do with yourself, and, uh, you might have heard it, maybe... It's something you're convicted, some mission you're convicted, you're called to. And, and then somebody tries to talk you out of it, saying, no, you're just feeling inspired because you know this other person who does a similar thing, and you really haven't thought enough about the risks, and you haven't, you haven't calculated, done all these calculations to figure out whether it's really in your best interest. But the thing is, you did, you just knew. And you knew that you knew. And when you know that you know something, the objective arguments that are relevant to the question aren't actually relevant because they can't change the fact that you knew that you knew. And if that's interior and subjective, it's almost futile to get into a debate about it, because you can't share that interior subjective understanding with someone. It's just something you have. It's part of your existence. And you know that you have to be authentic to it, come what may. Otherwise, you're not even an authentic human being. And you can't be an authentic anything else without first being an authentic human being. Um, this, so I'm, I'm just trying to put this in terms of situations that we can relate to. Because, again, I don't suppose most of us have had as extreme a, uh, a, an event as, as this. And hopefully most people don't have to. But for Kierkegaard, he did have to. And I'll just throw out there that a lot of people in Kierkegaard's situation do have to make this very decision. Kierkegaard, I don't know what denomination he was, but his denomination allowed... Uh, <coughs> Oh, he didn't want to be a pastor or a priest either, but his denomination did allow uh, married pastors and stuff. Other denominations don't. So many people are in this precise situation. They have to ask themselves, what do I, who am I most fundamentally and deeply? What am I called to in the deepest level? The ministry or the married life? So many, uh, many young people go through this very dilemma that Kierkegaard was in. And they have to, that you can't, Objective arguments don't even matter. Because the best an objective argument can do in this case is talk about how great one of them is versus the other. But you already know they're both great. It's not about that. It's about you. And who are you at your deepest level? Lutheran. What's that? Lutheran. He was Lutheran? Oh, thank you. I'm glad. Okay, it's good. I, that's something I should have looked up a while ago. I did not know that. So he's Lutheran. And then, yeah, so Lutheran, Lutheranism does allow... Uh, their pastors to be married. So he didn't, for that reason, have to engage in this dilemma. But to this day, many do. Um, so let's move along now, because he's got a lot more to say than just talking about his own little struggles here. This is, um, you know what, I should, if we can squeeze it in, I put down one more thing with this. This reality would be, and I'll say this a couple times because some of you won't be able to read it probably. This is contra-deconstructionism. Or as the 
against the deflection. When you break something apart, when you deconstruct something, you know, you deconstruct a physical machine to try to make sense of how it works, and that's very helpful for training engineers and mechanics and things like that. But you try to deconstruct a person and it doesn't work. Because sometimes the whole is what? So, exactly. Sometimes the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Deconstructionism is the philosophy that supposes you can figure everything out by breaking it up into its parts and just considering each. And that's great in some cases. Again, it works great in engineering. Uh, it doesn't work with the human person. You can't look at each individual. Uh, you can't just break apart the experiences that people have and suppose that you can make them not mean what the person who experienced them knew that they did mean. You brought up being in love. There was some study, some uh, study that said biochemically that's the same as you did the what this study said, and who knows if it's right or not, but what this study says is that biochemically, neurologically, it's the same as um, eating chocolate. And if you've ever been in love, you know that's not true. Maybe, sure, maybe it's biochemically the same, but who cares? There's much more to it than that. You know full well that that is a much deeper reality than enjoying chocolate. Uh, the deconstructionist would have you think, no, there's no difference. It's the same thing. So Kierkegaard had to break off that engagement to live his religious life as authentically as possible. And he, the author acknowledges here, the religious type might seem an abnormal one to our secular and naturalistic minds. But there, but there it is, it exists in sufficient plenty throughout history. Only a very parochial and dogmatic mind can fail to accord this type at least its own psychological right to be. So he's being, the author is being intentionally ironic here. He's admitting that a modern mind might have a hard, modern mind with, uh, modern secular mind might have a very difficult time on even comprehending this slightly. How does that make any sense? But this author is saying you'd have to be quite dogmatic, <laughs> dogmatically secular, to not realize that this is a legitimate type of person who, who has this need to be authentic in this manner. And you have to afford them, he says, the right to be. And the knowledge they exist, and this is real. Kierkegaard's case, to be sure, was complicated because he himself longed passionately for marriage, home, family, blisses, and the tedium of the commonplace. His writings are packed with eulogies of these. What's that supposed to mean? His writings are packed with eulogies of these things. A eulogy of something is what? Farewell. Yeah, and it's what, what's the tone of a eulogy? Like it's dead. It's dead, but you're praising it also. Really, most eulogies are all they do is praise the person, which is probably the right thing to do. Um, so that's the thing. He's not condemning these things. He, he's writing eulogies to them. He, he, he's still loving the idea of these things, but they're dead to him. He, the, the, he has died to the world in that regard completely. His most touching picture of the man of faith is of. An ordinary bourgeois pater familias, I don't know what he's talking about there, sunk deep in the life of domesticity. The point is, it's the domesticity, domestic life. Naturally, then, he never ceased to regret the loss of Regina. For him, it was a sacrifice as drastic as Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. This is key for Kierkegaard. I don't ask you for it on the discussion sheet, but we should probably just quickly run through that so you know what is being talked about here. Uh, for Kierkegaard, one of the central themes in all scripture, in, his, in, in how to become a Christian, is a, a sacrifice of Abraham. Uh, anyone want to run, want to remind the rest of us here what that is, for those who might not be as aware of it? What is he talking about, the sacrifice of Abraham? When God asked uh, Abraham to uh, sacrifice his son, and he was about to, and then God sent down a goat instead, I believe. Yeah, so it was a test. He didn't actually kill his son. But it was the most brutal test in the history of Christian and Jewish and Islamic scriptures. It went to all of them. Um, this is such a, this is, yes, this is, I mean, the sacrifice of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, that's like pivotal in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. 
And it's so, it, it's kind of almost abhorrent at first, when you first hear of it, that Isaac, although in, in Islamic scriptures it's Ishmael, in Christian and Jewish scriptures it's Isaac, and Kierkegaard, of course, is a, is a Christian, um, was this son promised to Abraham he, as an old man who wanted nothing but to have a son his whole life, but his wife couldn't conceive. Um, and then, out of, and then, finally, as a very old man, he, he his wife conceives, and they have this son, and all of his hope is placed in this son, all of his hope. And then, some one day, God says, "Sacrifice that son to me." This is back when human sacrifice is not uncommon, um, so you can certainly put it in that cultural context. And Abraham does so. He doesn't complete it, but he doesn't complete the physical act. But, in his, he, but he did get so close to doing it that God knew, yep, he, he would have done that. He wouldn't withhold his only son. So this was the ultimate test in all, again, the whole Christian, Jewish, Islamic tradition. This is the ultimate test in all scripture. It's not usually supposed to be taken to be a norm of life uh, for an ordinary person. This is a singular event with no parallels in all scripture. Don't... Um, if anybody thinks that God is asking, if any of you think God is asking you to sacrifice someone, please um, come to my office hours. We'll talk about that. And uh, I hope to convince you that God is not asking you to uh, sacrifice someone. Uh, that's that's no, no, no more of that. Um, but anyway, why you can see now why this is a big deal for Kierkegaard. God didn't say to Abraham, "Oh, stop committing this sin that you're committing that I don't like." That's no big deal stopping committing a sin, because a sin is not something you should be doing anyway, by definition. But instead, he says, sacrifice this thing that you place all your hope in. Sacrifice this thing that you, on a, on a temporal, worldly level, want more than anything else. Sacrifice. That, uh, this, that sacrifice of Abraham, as you can see, Kierkegaard feels that, it, that this was almost as hard for him as, as Abraham sacrificing his son, breaking off the engagement with Regina. And yet, it was willed by God, and that was all that mattered for Kierkegaard in order for him to become who he ultimately was. So this is this theme is in the background of almost all of Kierkegaard's thought, the sacrifice of Abraham. All right, moving along to Hegel's cosmology here. Oh, we're, oh no, we're not running out of time. This is, this is a longer class. If he had given up the girl and sunk into an aimless and irreligious life, we would be justified in finding his renunciation only an act of impotent neurosis. At the moment of renunciation, indeed, there flashed before Kierkegaard's mind another pair of alternatives, a life of unbridled sensuality, or an absolutely religious one. We, who are able to look back on his life and spread it out before us as a whole, are not likely to believe that this first alternative was really possible for Kierkegaard. He had the vocation from the start, to be sure. It was a mixed, torment, and ambiguous vocation, but a triumphant one, too. He chose what he had to become. This does not in the least mean that it was not a free choice. On the contrary, it had to be renewed freely, day by day, for, for the rest of his life, if it were to be given meaning. Kierkegaard was, that is, what he had to be. But he had to be it by making the free choice every day to renew that choice. This is touching on one of the most fundamental paradoxes in the philosophy of religion and theology. Even. What? How can you be both what and what? I thought Hegel was coming from this page. It's actually the next one. He, oh, well, all good and all known. Okay, well, that's, yeah, that's fundamental, definitely. Is that? That's related. How can we be both how can there be something you have to be, and yet how can you also at the same time be happy? Happy? Free. How can we be both fated and free? It's admittedly paradoxical. It seems like it's one or the other. If we're fated, if we have a destiny that is ours, then it would seem that we can't what? 
You can't escape it. You can't escape it. You can't fail it. There's, there, there's nothing you can do to not arrive at it. But that, if that's the case, then it seems that we're not free. Well, Kierkegaard didn't believe it. Oh, no. Yeah, that's the thing. Kierkegaard believes we're absolutely free. And yet we also have a destiny, something we must be. Um, some, actually, Christian theologians don't believe in, in, in this kind of freedom. Like, I don't even know if Martin Luther did, ironically. Did you? Oh, yeah. Another no, no, question. Wait, did we, I come out. did we answer that? If he's all good and all knowing, we can answer that. Oh, yeah. So that's... Plus. That was... Um, well, yeah, we, so that's something that was asked even in ancient Greece, actually. If, if because of the existence of evil... And it, it's related to this one that Kierkegaard is considering, but it's, it is different. Real quick. Because of the existence of either God, evil, God either what, what, or what? Is an all-powerful, doesn't care, or... He's an all-good. Or the, for the easiest to answer would be he's just... Doesn't exist. Doesn't even exist. Yeah. So, because of evil, God either doesn't exist, or isn't all good, or isn't all powerful. Because... If he were good, and if he were all good and all powerful, it seems he would eradicate. Yeah. eradicate it. Yeah. And, and the, the philosophers of religion, Aquinas, Augustine, say, yes, God is all good. He does exist. He is all good. He is all powerful. And there's evil. How? Well, because every single evil that occurs must meet three conditions in order for it to not be a contradiction. God must know that is going to bring a good out of it. The good that is going to bring out of it must be greater than the evil itself, and there must be no other way. Uh, they say, if those three conditions are met, the problem of evil is not a real problem. Uh, which is uh, one of the most consoling... It's one of the most yeah. consoling philosophical... Te- if, you, if you do believe in an all-good, all-powerful God, that's, this is pure philosophy. This doesn't feel as scripture at all. Um, it's probably the most consoling philosophical teaching there is. Uh, that every, so, that we're right for the senior moment here. here. Um, <laughs> he needs to know because Okay, so yeah, so if, so for any evil to so much as be allowed to occur, because you can't just say, uh, Augustine at first, his first answer wasn't the best, he just said, well, God didn't create evil, it's not substance. It's like darkness is the absence of light. You don't need to ask who created the darkness, it's, it's an absence of something. But that still doesn't sufficiently uh, address the problem of evil because you can still say, okay, fine, God didn't cause evil, but why doesn't he eradicate it? Yeah, it was all powerful. So, yes, he, the, the criteria are he must know with certainty, because he knows the future, that he's going to bring a good out of it. That good must be greater than the evil he allows to occur. And there must be absolutely no other way. And you might say that that third condition can't be applied to God if he's omnipotent, but even omnipotence can't create an effect intrinsically linked to a cause without that cause. Uh, he has to bring about the cause first to, to allow that effect if it's intrinsically related to the cause. So does it have to be all three or just one? All three. So if you believe that, if you believe in an all good, all powerful God, then logically it follows from that that all three of those conditions are met. It with every single negative thing that happens in your life. Every single pain, suffering, tragedy, every single one is guaranteed to have those three conditions applied to it. What was the second one? There must be a greater good. The first, yeah, the first is that a good must come from it. The second is that good will actually be greater. Than evil. If it weren't greater, it wouldn't make any sense for all good, all powerful beings to even allow the, the evil if it wants to be greater good uh, to come from. Doesn't all knowing imply that there is no free will? That's the so that's the puzzle that Boethius took up a little later. Free will in essence, though. It's very it, that this is more related to the conundrum we're in now. So faded versus free. How the heck does that jive? If God knows the future, isn't he just like Laplace's demon? So Laplace was a philosopher, a mathematician. Back then, everybody was there. If you were a mathematician, you were also a physicist, and you were also a philosopher, and you were also a theologian, like you were a... But, but he says, has anyone heard of Laplace's demon? It's just a thought experiment. If, it, if, there's, only, if there's only matter, then if there were some demon who knows the exact position and momentum of every particle in the universe, he would also thereby know what? Everything. Yes, everything about now and 
future. The entire future. Because just like a pool, like a pool table, if you had a good enough computer that can simulate the momentum of each uh, pool ball, as soon as the cue ball, is that the white ball, cue ball? Yep. Yeah. As soon as the cue ball leaves the stick, just knowing that uh, position and momentum velocity and the positions you know, of all the other ones, you wouldn't even need to watch that shot play out. The computer could tell you exactly what ball is going in what pocket and where each one will wind up. Now, even our best supercomputer, I don't think can model something either that simple still. But, it, but it's, it's pretty straightforward to see that that's theoretically possible. It wouldn't, there's no, in other words, there's no mystery in that. There's no mystery at all. Deterministic mechanical phenomena are going to determine where those balls go. But is everything like that? No, I was say there's non-physical phenomena. Exactly. So if there's non-physical phenomena, then those cannot necessarily be modeled by deterministic uh, standards. And Laplace's demon does not necessarily know the future. And here's the fundamental irony. You can't ever say that because the mere existence of a being that knows the future, his knowledge is itself outside of what? A being that knows the future is not. The knowledge, here's a philosophical axiom. Knowledge of a thing is always distinct from the thing itself. So the mere second you assert a being that knows everything, that knowledge itself is not a part of the equation that he knows. And it introduces an unknown into the equation. So you can never say determinism actually fails as soon as you introduce knowledge into the question. The only way determinism could ever be right is if there were no awareness of anything. Wait, so is that like the, is that sort of like, like a time paradox? Like, like when you, if someone from the future comes and tells you what happens, uh -oh. what doesn't happen? Time. You don't know? Yeah. No, it gets confusing. <laughs> so here's that, so, so like that's the answer. So Boethius says, God does know the future, but you are still free not because he determines what you do and, and takes away your freedom, but because he is not in time. It's, Boethius says God is in eternity, and all the whole past and the whole future, not to mention the present, are spread out before him like a picture. He just sees it. So by knowing what you're going to do in the future, he's not predicting it. He's describing it. He sees it right in front of him. Like, so, it's, so that's Boethius's. It, Boethius was a Roman philosopher. He wrote The Constellation of Philosophy, still one of the greatest works of philosophy. Like Socrates, he too was executed for his principles. Um, but uh, the uh, so anyway, he's this is yeah. If if you want to stay true to your principles, there's not many places you'll really fit in for too long, and, as they discover. Um, so what the heck? Has, so where were? Oh yeah. So Kierkegaard's uh, concern: faded versus free. He's, this is who he has to be. And yet he's absolutely free to make that choice as well. It, it, it's ironic that Martin Luther's brought up in the next sentence in the book because, I might be wrong in this, I don't think Martin Luther really believed in free will. Uh, he seems to be more determinist than, I don't know. Kind of in between. But, so kind of between. He okay. helped bring in Calvinism, which is very... Very predestination. Yeah. You can't, you're, you're, you've got a, a destiny that's sealed and there's really nothing you can do to contradicted or uh, living. So anyway, both, I think we all kind of naturally rebel against both of those extremes. The notion that we're not free, the notion that everything is determined. We seem to crave both destiny and freedom. And Boethius will say, yes, we have both. Kierkegaard too, I think, will say, yes, we have both. You have destiny and you are free. You must choose it. You must well up from within the deepest recesses of your soul. Having lived through the breaking of his engagement, Kierkegaard could never become a Hegelian. Here we are at Hegel. This seems random. Having broken off his engagement, he could never be a Hegelian. Uh, so a Hegelian is a philosopher who follows in the tradition of Hegel, George Hegel. And Hegel, uh, the, he comes up in my intro fill classes briefly as well, usually. Hegel generated what's probably the most convoluted, complex philosophical system in the history of philosophy. Cosmic rationalism. He could fit, so he thought, everything that could be asserted inside his philosophical system. Which implies, if something doesn't fit into this rationalistic philosophical system, it doesn't 
It doesn't want this. It's not even real. It's not, not to be bothered with. It's to be, it's to be rejected as a mere fantasy or fiction. Um, the drastic either or. Either or is the title of one of Kierkegaard's works. The drastic either or of choice had cut through his life as decisively as a sword, and no philosopher's balm could remove the pain of loss. The man who has chosen irrevocably, whose choice has once and for all sundered him from a certain possibility for himself in his life, is thereby thrown back on the reality of the self in all its mortality and finitude. He is no longer a spectator of himself as a mere possibility. He is that self in its reality. The anguish of loss may be redeemed, but it can never be mediated. Reality for the man who has been called upon to make such a choice, is just the reality of his own mortal, finite, bleeding self. And this reality can never be absorbed in a whole in which that finite suffering becomes unreal. The absolute of Hegel embraces all reality and swallows up every contradiction and every finite evil. All right, that was a lengthy quote, but this is contextualizing Kierkegaard's rejection of Hegelianism. Hegel wants to make sense, wants to make perfect rationalistic sense of everything that occurs. And he kind of wants to, as a part of that rationalistic system, explain away all pain and loss as not nothing really. It, it all kind of fits in this system that, 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 I, that, that he's generated. And it's one thing for someone who's never really suffered to say that, but this broken engagement was so utterly tragic for Kierkegaard, he could never he could never believe that. He could never uh, be told to just oh, just approach, just approach that with the right mindset, and it'll make perfect sense, and you'll be fine. He could never tolerate his loss being explained away. And, and he could never tolerate one pretending that his loss was something less than it was. That it was true it was a true tragedy. It could not be explained as anything but. Um, in other words, Kierkegaard would have absolutely nothing to do with a movement that is popular today. The uh, power of positive Thank you. thinking, the power of positive thinking, the law of attraction. You just think enough good thoughts, and, and it just manifests positive things in your life. You just think these giddy, happy, positive thoughts enough, and it just, all these things that you thought were bad and evil in your life, no, they're, they're not actually, you just weren't thinking about them correctly before. Kierkegaard would just vomit all over you if you said that too, because it's, it's so revolt. The idea that you can just think away the dark side of life is just pathetic in his mind. You have to embrace it. You have to be completely and brutally honest about it. It's there. Kierkegaard is not despairing. This might make him seem like he's despairing. He's not. This is, he's, he's not saying there's not a plan. Remember, his whole mission here is to become a Christian in the fullest sense of the word. And a Christian believes that it's all part of the plan. In the end, it will work out and make perfect and beautiful sense. But right now, it doesn't necessarily. Right now, things can be twisted, and you can't explain those twisted things away. Uh, so the, the later in the reading, points out, we're not going to get to it today, so... Oh, no, no, we will. It's, it's actually right here. I thought it was later. He, ne despite this incredible darkness, this incredible, brutal honesty, he never sunk into despair. He never sunk into doubt. He never doubted his faith for a moment. He never uh, thought that evil was ultimately triumphant and darkness would have the last word or anything like that. Uh, he, he was kind of like Job. Job, as we watched you know, a couple of units ago, Job did not hesitate to bring his full emotion before God and be completely blunt about the, the evil going on in, and, and in his own soul even, the, the darkness in his own soul. But he never once cursed God, as all his friends were telling him to do. He never failed, he never faltered. Same with Kierkegaard. He, he said some ridiculous things maybe, but he never uh, really failed in the deepest sense there. Let me put something down on the board here. Hegel's cosmology. Okay, Hegel's cosmology is a rationalism. Okay. 
that quote, I'm just going to directly quote it from the book there, swallows up everything else. The real is the rational, and the rational is the real. That's a quote from, directly from Hegel. But the subjective cannot necessarily be phrased in purely rational terms. Therefore, according to Hegelian rationalism, the subjective ought to be discarded and not considered. It's nothing, really. Because to say the real is the rational and the rational is the real is to say those are identical concepts. The square, the square is a rectangle, we know that, but this also says the rectangle is a square. In other words, there is nothing real that is not purely within this rationalistic system. That would be Hegelianism. Now, why is this so pivotal for Kierkegaard as well? Well, first of all, he rejects it on those grounds we just discussed. But Kierkegaard sees the Danish church as Hegelianism in disguise. He sees that he is severe, as you saw in the video, he is severely critical of the church of his day as being Christianity light, as being a nothing more than a Hegelian philosophy dressed up with some biblical language. Lukewarm, nominal, not demanding the existential commitment that Christianity itself does and should be saying here. Uh, what else? Let's have a couple of things down about Hegelian, he Hegel's rationalism though, because this is something that You'll probably hear about it if you take any other philosophy courses down the road. Single formula of the triad explains all that has transpired. Now, it doesn't mean it's a simple system, it's not, but this triad is like the ultimate concept. The single formula of the triad explains all. Does anyone remember the triad? I think I briefly talked about it in intro, Phil. Thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Everything fits into one of those. Throughout history, there's this, there's this inevitable working out of the perfect synthesis. And every, every step, in, and I am no Hegelian, so I'm sure I'm I'm sure I'm saying things now that an actual Hegelian would hate me for saying, but probably not perfectly accurately describing his philosophy. But the gist of it is that all that has transpired in history, even, history itself is the working out of the triad, which is thesis being opposed by antithesis, and then after those two comes the synthesis, which is an improvement on these two, moves history forward, purges away the error in both, and takes what is good from both generating a new synthesis that uh, can move society forward. And thought forward, this, is, this applies to history, politics, religion, philosophy itself. It's a metaphilosophical view in that case. Um, in other words, don't lament anything that's happened. It was all part of the triad. It was all part of kind of things rational, rationally working out over time. Uh, does anyone know what other philosopher was really inspired by this and made his own ism out of it. Marx. Mar this is called the Hegelian dialectic sometimes. Uh, Marx, you know, I, I am no expert in Marx, but he saw the factors leading up to his day as priming the stage for the synthesis of communism. So uh, there's certainly problems with this, but there's also insights in it. But if you try to make sense of everything, you know, the, the philosopher's quest and then the rational art era is to be able to make sense of everything with this one single approach, then you're going to miss out on most of the most important things. So that, uh, that could uh, never work for Kierkegaard. Help, just a couple minutes, let me quickly polish off this section because this is just about a good sovereign point here. Uh, he could never. He could never try and just explain away what had happened. 
Therefore, the absolute Hegel, Hegelianist rationalist approach would always be absurd. Kierkegaard, of course, being thoroughly human, hoped that his loss would be made good, that Regina might be restored. But he knew that this could only be through a miracle of faith. The cosmic rationalism of Hegel would have told him his loss was not real loss, but only, only the appearance of loss. And this would have been an abominable insult to his suffering. Kierkegaard says this is an insult to suffering that you know is real. It tells you to look at all loss as just apparent, as not real evil, as just something you misidentified as evil because you weren't thinking positively about it. Um, Kierkegaard is not despairing because, as the author says right here, his hope exists, but it's placed in what? Yeah, a miracle of faith. Like, basically, he's placing his hope in eternity entirely. Um, he, he, so that's, that's what guards him against despair. Otherwise, if he didn't have that hope, he would be deeply despairing. Kierkegaard knew all of this already, but the experience of the broken engagement clinched before him. The episode of the engagement thus becomes a human drama in which the ultimate meaning is religious and philosophical. For the thinker, as for the artist, what counts in life is not the number of rare and exciting adventures he encounters, but the inner depth in that life, by which something great may be made out of even the paltriest and most banal of occurrences. Depth. We, are, we should seek depth. The moral story with that, we should seek depth more than breadth. Breadth is what we frantically are always seeking after and trying to maybe beef up our resume or something or beef up our Facebook page and make ourselves look cooler. The more it seems you've done, the better. Okay, the, that's uh, the opposite of the approach we should have. That we should, the depth of our experiences matters much more, even if on the outside they look like small things. To experience them deeply is what really matters. The remarkable thing about Kierkegaard was that the cloud of sighs and tears he shed never got in the way of seeing what he was after. No man ever hewed more strictly to the line of his own truth. He was absolutely, he never uh, doubted his faith, he never deviated from it one bit. Kierkegaard succeeded in Nietzsche's own words, in becoming the individual he was. Analysis of him will not advance our understanding if it attempts in kind of critical daydream to transform him into some altogether different individual. Succeeded in becoming who he was. What conclusion did Kierkegaard come to while smoking a cigar in Copenhagen? This, I think that's my single favorite question on any of my discussion sheets. So let's save it for next class. Oh. <laughs> Have an excellent couple days, and if Hudson Valley isn't closed by then, or if the